our topic is Samuel Rutherford, and this is the third subject in this series, and I want to pause for a moment over the links between them. We looked first of all at John Knox, and then at Robert Bruce. And we saw that Bruce heard Knox preach once at St. Andrews. There's a direct link between Bruce and Knox from that point of view. Bruce was instrumental in the conversion of Alexander Henderson, the minister of Luchers. And Henderson was, in many ways, the architect of the National Covenant, 1638, and the most outstanding figure of that whole covenanting period. Henderson was a great scholar, but he was above all else a great statesman, a man of great vision, and also of enormous diplomatic and political skill. However, Henderson left little in writing. What he did leave was mainly in pamphlet form, and his public sermons have, I suspect, only a remote connection with the actual delivery that Henderson himself gave them. But around Henderson there clustered a remarkable galaxy of extremely able young men. And four of those men deserve particular mention. First of all, there was David Dixon. Dixon was at one level a great pioneering biblical scholar who left us outstanding commentaries on the book of Psalms on Matthew's Gospel and also on the Epistle of the Hebrews. He was minister at Irving and Ayrshire in the early part of the 17th century and during that time saw a great revival in his old parish. It was in fact a revival of national notoriety and led to what was called the designation the so-called Ayrshire disease or the Irving disease because it was accompanied by certain phenomena that survivors often are because of the weakness of our human constitutions. But Irving's mass at that time was crammed every Sunday evening with dozens of inquirers asking counsel under their own spiritual concern. And it's remarkable that going that far back there were after church fellowships in the August Manses of Presbyterian Scotland. Dixon was famous, perhaps above all else, as a spiritual psychologist. He was a master in the art of dissecting the soul and its various moods and troubles. And his outstanding composition was a book called Therapeutica Sacra, which is literally simply sacred therapy. That book was written in Latin, but it was translated after Dixon's death. But it has ever since been republished, and it's actually a very rare volume, which we have copied in the college library, but I've never seen any other copy anywhere else. And we are, in fact, working at the college to reproduce or reprint some of those books on CDs, but we haven't yet got to the stage of publishing any of them. So that was the first of those great men, this man called David Dixon. Then there was George Gillespie, who died in his early 30s. He was minister at Kilcoddy. Gillespie was a prodigy of learning. He was also a ferocious debater and polemic, who used to marshal argument upon argument and didn't always know when to stop. Gillespie's work was mainly in the area of church government, writing on such things as presbytery and church-state relations and on what he dared to call English poppy ceremonies. Gillespie was the arch-puritan of the covenanting movement. He also left what's called a treatise of miscellany questions, which discusses a large number of theological issues with very great acumen. There are two famous stories about Gillespie linked to the Westminster Assembly, which he attended as a Scottish commissioner. When uh, there is a legend that when they were discussing the question, what is God, for the short catechism, the assembly was quite stuck for an answer. And the legend is that they called Gillespie to pray, 
And he rose and uttered those words, O God, the Spirit, infinite, eternal, unchangeable, and so on, and gave the whole answer just extemporaneously in the prayer. And uh, they had seen him before he rose to pray, writing on a piece of paper. And it is said that when they looked at the paper afterwards, it had written upon it simply the words, Da Lucem Domine, give light, Lord. It is a very intriguing and very moving story, but unfortunately its status is quite questionable, and I suspect it is more legend than truth. The other story is that when we're discussing church decorations, the great Erastian and Hebraic John Selden made a masterly speech supporting the Erastian point of view that the state had authority over the church. And Gillespie then rose in reply. I made a devastating critique of Selden's case. And it is said then that Selden said, that young man with one speech has demolished, he said, the learning of a lifetime. And that is not legend, that is actually true. The third of those figures, and a very attractive one, is James Durham, who also died as a young man. Durham was a great preacher, but also a great and erudite scholar. And he left us some outstanding works, such as his commentary on the Song of Solomon, and also on Isaiah 53, a series of sermons. But perhaps most important of all, a great book called A Treatise on Scandal. Now, a scandal here has its technical New Testament sense of a stumbling block, and it has a subtitle, A Dying Man's Plea to the Church of Scotland. It was written by Darrell very much on his deathbed, as divisions began to emerge in the Kirk around the period 1649. And Darrell warned the Church against schism and division. And this book is a magnificent plea for church unity. And it almost amounts to the statement that nothing justifies division among Christians. And it is a great loss to us that that book and its impact have been so much lost on the church subsequently. Much is made of the tendency of the Presbyterian church towards division. But it is a remarkable fact that between 1560 and 1688, there was only one church in Scotland with no divisions. While in the south, in that same period, there were multiple divisions and endless multiplication of sects. Now, Durham's book would replay a careful study uh, in a study group over many, many weeks. And it has one fascinating thesis, and that is that there is no biblical doctrine of separation corresponding to its doctrine of union. Now, sadly, the Reformed Church, not least in our lifetime, has tended to have a kind of symmetrical doctrine that on the one hand there is a case for separation and on the other a case for union. Now, these covenanting theologians like Durham had no such doctrine. To them the idea of two real churches of Christ in the one place was an absurdity. There couldn't be two churches in one place. And they would argue, you never needed reasons to unite you would need compelling reason to separate. In fact, Darren could scarcely contemplate any ground for separation from other Christians. So there were these three men. There was Dixon, Gillespie, and Durham. And then fourthly, there was Samuel Rutherford. Now, there were many others, of course, younger men and lesser light in the same era. It was an era of a remarkable flourishing of talent in the Church of Scotland. And it really is astonishing that in the same time work, 
you have simultaneously Henderson, Dixon, Gillespie, Durham and Rutherford, all adorning the church at one and the same period. Well, tonight our focus is very much on Rutherford. He was born in 1600 and died in 1661. And that means that his life covered one of the most tempestuous periods in the whole of British history. He lived under the three most absolutist Stuart monarchs, James I, Charles I, and Charles II, but of course also lived under Oliver Cromwell, who uh, imposed his own kind of rigid order, but Scotland did very much, of course, on England. Rutherford lived through the English Civil War, and of course through its aftermath, and lived to see also the advent of the covenant persecution with the Restoration of Charles I in 1660. If I could just run through his career briefly, he was appointed regent at Edinburgh University in the year 1621. That was a very mature age at that point for such a position, he was age 21. He left that position in 1625. And there is some debate as to what precipitated his dismissal. He was dismissed from his post by the university. It seems fairly clear that there was some irregularity uh, relating perhaps to his marriage and possibly antinuptial fornication. This is not at all certain, but the evidence points in that particular direction. And Rutherford himself indicates that there was a time in his life when he could not understand another human being laughing or being at sport, because his own despondency and depression were so acute. But whatever the regularity, he was eventually reponed and he was inducted to the congregation of Anworth in Ayrshire in 1627. Now here again it's a remarkable instance of God's providence because you might have thought that a man with such magnificent talent would have found a sphere equal to those talents. But as in the case of Thomas Boston, Rutherford's main work was done in this rural backwater. And backwater it was, because Anworth is simply a country area without any kind of focus. There is actually no town of Anworth, it is more a parish with no particular centre. It was a rustic community, and we may imagine that in those days, of course, there was very strict Calvinism that kept order and discipline throughout Scotland, but that was sort of the case, and on one occasion, Rutherford had to go along to the local green to uh, rebuke the young men who were playing football on the Sabbath day. This was a standard practice in many Scottish parishes at the time. And Rutherford had been grieved by it Sunday after Sunday, but at last he could bear it no longer, and off he went to rebuke them. Now I tell that because it gives the lie to a widespread impression that 17th century Scotland lived under some kind of street Calvinist hegemony, which the clergy held total authoritarian sway. That was not the case at all. It's interesting too that Rutherford said he pointed to three large boulders, and he said, these stones, he said, will bear witness to me. And to my witness, to my words to you, again to the desecration of the Lord's day. And we know from Thomas Chalmers' memoirs that sometime in the 1840s, Chalmers visited Anworth and stood profoundly moved in Rutherford's pulpit. It was much distressed that Rutherford's manse had just then been demolished. He didn't quite see why. And he tells us that these three stones, known as Rutherford's Witnesses, were still remembered in the parish, and in fact two were still on the same spot 
in the 1840s. I don't know if that's true still today, but this is kind of story that one associates with Rutherford. Now, strangely enough, Rutherford saw little blessing on his Anworth ministry. You may recall that in the last words of Rutherford, which I'll come back to later on, there is a line that says, Oh, if one soul from Anworth meet me at God's right hand, my heaven will be two heavens in Emmanuel's land. And these lines, in fact, pick up a very poignant sentence in his letters where he wishes for even one soul as a fruit of his ministry. The success of Rutherford did have, oddly enough, was more among the gentry than among the ordinary people. And it is again a remarkable fact, a sociological fact, that in the 17th century, the Reformed faith had a very firm hold of the aristocracy, and perhaps much less hold of the peasantry of uh, many parts of Scotland. While he was in Anworth, of course, episcopacy prevailed as the official religion of Scotland, and Rutherford, like Dixon and Gillespie, was very outspoken on this particular matter. And he was summoned inevitably to answer for his position because he had commented adversely upon the bishops and upon their Arminian theology. He was summoned to the Court of High Commission about uh, 1636. And as a result of that so-called trial, he was deposed from the ministry and he was also banished to the city of Aberdeen, uh, to which he went in 1636. Of course, we know that in that city, Rutherford wrote many of his famous letters and had many almost ecstatic spiritual experiences. But there were, as we shall see, moments of acute depression and despondency and frustration as well. However, the exile lasted only two years. And he returned south in 1638 to attend the famous Glasgow Covenanting Assembly in that year, 1638, and took a prominent part in the Assembly as well, the Assembly of the National Covenant. That year he was also called the Chair of Divinity in St Andrews, and he occupied that chair for the rest of his life until he died in uh, 1661. He was also, of course, a member of the Westminster Assembly from 1643 onwards, and took a very, very active part the debates and deliberations of uh, that assembly. Well, that is the life of Rutherford, more or less uh, in very quick outline to get the context uh, just in order. This is the first half of the 17th century, an era of enormous change. There is a famous book by the historian Christopher Hill, which has the title, The World Turned Upside Down. And that's what this period was. It was cataclysmic in terms of its sociological upheavals. And in fact, Hill argues that never in British history was there so much freedom of expression as there was during this particular period, and never were there so many exotic religions as there were during those 60 or so years. We don't know a great deal of Rutherford's preaching style. He appears to have, to have had something of a sheesh, which is the Gaelic equivalent of the Welsh idea of the hul, if I can pronounce that correctly. But some of you have heard me preach, especially in Gaelic, will know that we Gaelic folks sometimes lapse into a kind of rhythmic sing-song. And this was practiced at one point, not only in the Highlands, but also over large tracts of Scotland. Rutherford was also very, very active and energetic. And uh, someone said once, I thought he would fly out of the pulpit. 
with the energy that he put into his preaching. An English visitor who came to Scotland has left the tradition in the following terms. He said, I went to Irvine, he said, and I heard a comely old man with a long white beard, and he showed me my heart. This was David Dickson. I went to St Andrews and I heard a majestic looking man and he showed me the majesty of God. This was Robert Blair. And he said, I then heard a little fair haired man and he showed me the loveliness of Christ. And that was Samuel Rutherford. There is another story that Rutherford once sat at night at a knock on his door and he found a traveller there who requested lodging. This traveller was welcomed and entertained hospitably and then asked to share in the family devotions at the end of the day. And Rutherford then engaged in catechizing his family, his whole household, and he asked the visitor how many commandments there were. And the visitor said, eleven. And of course this caused some little consternation, but the man held his ground and said to Rutherford, ten, he said, in the Old Testament, but a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another, and so there are eleven commandments. So Rutherford was rather flummoxed and silenced by this. On Sunday morning, Rutherford, prior to preaching, went for a walk in his man's garden to meditate and to commit a sermon, I suppose, to heart and memory. And as he walked, he heard a voice in the bushes, the voice of a man praying, and praying with great earnestness for the ministry and for the services and for all the families of the parish. And it was a most unctuous and heavenly prayer. And Rutherford is said to recognize then that he had entertained an angel. And he asked the man who he was, and it turned out to be Archbishop Usher of Armagh, the greatest of the Anglican divines of the period, and one of the great divines of the European Church at any point in its history. And Rutherford then prevailed on the Archbishop to preach, which again says something of the ecumenicity of somebody who was often a stickler for Presbyterian proprieties. So here was this anti-Episcopalian asking the Archbishop to conduct a service in the parish kirk. And uh, Usher, and I wonder a little bit at this, was a dry mischievous, took us his text, a new commandment came out to that you love one another. But it was a memorable day, apparently, in the parish of Anworth. Rutherford is probably best remembered today for his many, many publications. And the extent of his writings is quite remarkable, and it is exceeded only by the extent of Rutherford's erudition. Because Rutherford, although he was very much the Orthodox theologian, was fully conversant with all the Catholic theology of the period and also with all the fathers in both Greek and Latin, as well as with the classical authors of a secular kind. In actual fact, with these men, one problem is that their erudition, their ability to, to quote and to amass arguments, often gets in the way of their rhetoric because they, they don't know when to stop. But Somebody said once of Rutherford, who rose at three o'clock every morning, three o'clock every morning, and lived to be 61 despite that, it was said of him that he was always preaching and always praying and always visiting the sick and always catechizing and always reading and always writing. Now, I doubt, but some of there is some exaggeration in there, but obviously this is a man of tireless industry. And even nursing a wife who was extremely ill, and attending to his parish, 
and even for it was a good, the Westminster Assembly, far from home, and fully involved in its business, he was still turning out books and pamphlets at a phenomenal rate. Now, the range of writing Rutherford is very, very extensive. Rutherford is one of the great Protestant scholastics, a collection of Western European theologians just after the Reformation who standardized in great Latin tomes the theology of the Reformation. And Rutherford wrote several such tomes. One was on the Arminian Doctrine of Grace, the other was De Providentia, on the providence of God. These deal with very, very subtle and speculative issues linked to the sovereignty of God and human responsibility. And they earned Rutherford a European-wide reputation such that he was twice called to be a professor for the famous Dutch universities, one of them being no less than Utrecht itself. Such was his standing among its European contemporaries. Rutherford also wrote out his sermons. There are three great volumes of sermons which I'll come to. And he wrote also, of course, a great political treatise called Lex Rex, The Law is King, which was, I think, of monumental significance for European and worldwide Western democracy. And, of course, also the famous letters for which he is best known at the present day. Now, let's linger over the letters just for a moment. There are, in all, 365 letters, very convenient, one for each day of the year, although a collection of some flexibility, that is more or less a standard number. 200 or more of what's written from his Aberdeen days, that is, in just two years of exile, between 1636 and 1638. They were not published in Rutherford's lifetime. They first the light of day in 1664, when they were published under the title Joshua Redivivus, Joshua Come Alive Again. And they were edited by Robert McWard, who was one of Rutherford's students and was an exile in the continent because of the covenanting persecution. Another outstanding theologian of the same period. Now, MacWard published the book anonymously and gave no place of publication and no address for the printer because the venture was extremely perilous. But the letter quickly became the staple fair of the covenanting peasantry of Scotland and secured immortality. And there have been many editions of them right out to the present day. Now, the best edition is this one by Samuel Rutherford, which was reissued, I think, in 1984. And it has a very useful biographical introduction by Andrew Bonner. And I'm not sure today how many people actually read those letters. My own view is that they are outstanding that they are quite superb spiritual essays. You can actually open the letters anywhere, any day, and any of them will feed your soul. There isn't a page here but is full of spiritual inspiration and sustenance. I'll maybe venture to quote just two or three items from, from the letters. First of all, you may recall that there is, well, I've referred to it already, the, the, there is a, a famous hymn called The Last Words of Samuel Rutherford. Now, this poem, which is what it is, was written, in fact, in the late 19th century by Mrs. A. R. Cousins, the wife of a free church minister in Melrose. And what Mrs. Cousins was a friend of Andrew Boner's and that whole circle, the change circle in the Free Church, uh, what she did was to weave into, the, into this poem some of the most memorable and most poetic utterances of the letters. And it's done very, very skillfully. She obviously knew the letters inside out. Now, 
in one of the verses, it's the famous one that, that, that tells us that the bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. And that's some letter uh, 21, written from Anworth in 1632, where Rutherford writes as follows. Our love to him should begin on earth, he says, as it shall be in heaven. For the bride taketh not by a thousand degrees so much delight in her wedding garment as she does in her bridegroom. So we, in the life to come, how be it, clothed with glories with a robe, shall not be so much affected with the glory that goeth about us as with the bridegroom's joyful face and presence. So here is Rutherford taking up the theme of Revelation, that the Lamb is the light and the glory of heaven, and expanding it in this way, and bringing out the force of the, the Christ focus of the glorified church. And then if we look down further to 1636, he is talking here about the cross and, and the sufferings just about to begin. And he, he writes as follows. How be he says, Christ's green cross, newly laid upon me, be somewhat heavy. When I call to mind the many fair days, sweet and comfortable to my soul, and to the souls of many others, and how young ones in Christ are plucked from the breast, and the inheritance of God laid waste. Yet, that sweet-smelled and perfumed cross of Christ is accompanied with sweet refreshments, with the kisses of a king, with the joy of the Holy Ghost, with faith that the Lord hears the sighing of a prisoner, with undoubted hope after this night to see daylight and Christ's sky to clear up again upon me and this poor kirk. Now, here is somebody who is feeling very much the pain and burden of the cross and yet at the same time knows God's comfort in that very situation. Now, there is a hint here of what perhaps is something of a problem with Rutherford for many of us, that the, the preoccupation with love means that very often Rutherford uses language which is almost erotic in describing Christ. You have it there in a way, the sweet-smelled and perfumed cross of Christ is accompanied with sweet refreshments, with the kisses of a king. And this does sometimes give offence, and certainly I would not use this kind of language myself, it's not my style. But it could claim the warrant of Psalm 45 and of course the Song of Solomon, which also use language which is nuptial. And it's also warranted by Paul's comparison of the church to the bride of Christ in Ephesians. But it's, it's a bit strange paradox that this man who was so, who could write such scholastic theology in Latin, and at some levels would fight his shadow, or his theological shadow in any case, can yet speak this marvelous, nuptial, erotic language in relation to Christ the Savior. He says in the same letter, all would be well if I were free of all challenges for giftiness and for neglecting my calling and for speaking too little for my well-beloved's crown, honor and kingdom. So this man who to us was so many talented and so zealous, he is lamenting his inefficiency and his ineffectiveness as a minister of Christ neglect of my calling, and speaking too little for my well-beloved's crown and kingdom, and he longs to go back and make reparation and atonement for that neglect. Oh, he says, for a day in the assembly of the saints to advocate for King Jesus. If I could only get back 
the chance to go back to Anworth one more day to make up for all those neglected days and speak once more to the saints to advocate for King Jesus. This, he says, is my only exercise that I fear I have done little good in my ministry. That is his lament. But I dare not but say I loved the birds of the wedding chamber and prayed for and desired the thriving of the marriage and coming of his kingdom. Again, this uh, language of love, of nuptials, of marriage, the idiom that is using, uh, at least in the letters. And then we have the letters from Aberdeen, which one here from September 5th, 1636. Christ has so handsomely fitted for my shoulders this rough tree of the cross, as that it hurteth me no ways. God sung, and fair weather conveyeth me to my time paradise in Aberdeen. He was going into exile, and uh, it was almost in the context of like being sent to Siberia. Not simply because Aberdeen was so far north, but because Aberdeen was so Episcopal and so Arminian and so anti all that Brother Ford stood for the clergy that gave him a really tough time. And yet he's speaking here of Aberdeen, this exile, as this time paradise in Aberdeen. There was another eternal paradise, but there was also this time paradise. So it's the old principle, I suppose, that walls and prison bars don't make a prison. His spirit was free. But what about this other idea that Rutherford has, which I find problematical? Christ has so handsomely fitted from my shoulders as rough tree of the cross as that it hurteth me no ways. And it worries me a bit. I am sure that Rutherford at this point was content by God's grace. But it worries me that sometimes Christians don't find the cross comfortable. And it worries me because really the very essence of the cross is that it doesn't fit. A cross that suits our temperament, that cross is in many ways not a cross at all. It is the cross that goes against our temperament, the cross that hurts. But this was a cross fitted to your shoulders, and it was a comfortable cross. And I'm just wondering whether in many ways that kind of cross is a cross at all. Now, there are other moments in Rutherford, uh, in Aberdeen, when the cross doesn't fit, and when really he is having a sore struggle, trying to cope with his exile and its attendant difficulties. There is a letter again from November 22 of the same year, 1636, in which this comes out fairly, fairly clearly. He, what he found most difficult was his enforced silence. He had had a short ministry. It had borne little fruit. And he was asking a very pertinent question, really, in the depths of his own soul. If God called me to preach the gospel, why am I silenced? Why can't I preach? And that really is a most searching question that all silenced preachers can well understand. It's a great mystery, for example, why it's in Paul upon whom uh, the church so depended. Should I spend so much of its ministry in silent imprisonment? And this is what Rutherford is wrestling with because with his views of providence, what he's saying is, 
Why has God silenced me? Why am I allowed to, to open my tongue for Christ? My, uh, my silence on the Lord's day keeps me, he says, from being exalted above measure and from startling in the heat of my Lord's love. Again, the erotic language, the heat of my Lord's love. Some people affect me, for the which cause I hear the preacher hear purpose to have my confinement changed to another place. So cold is northern love, not very common better to the Aberdonians. So cold uh, is northern love, he says. But Christ and I will bear it. I have wrestled long with this sad silence. I said, what aileth Christ at my service? And my soul hath been at a pleading with Christ, and at yea and nay. But I will yield to him, providing my suffering may preach more than my tongue did. I will yield to providing my suffering may preach more than my tongue did. For I give her Christ an inch, but for twice as good again. You yield an inch to Christ, he says, and he gives you two inches back. In a word, I am a fool and he is God. I will hold my peace hereafter. Now, these are almost random instances. I began, when I read this volume, to note the back of the book, as I normally do, the various important aphorisms that I might want to quote later on. And uh, I soon ran out of space because there was so much which was absolutely memorable. Now, there are, of course, selections of these in much handier size and with this bulky volume. And, uh, Then there are Rutherford sermons. There are several volumes of those, and you may come across them occasionally in second-hand bookshops. At least two and three are still in some kind of circulation. One is entitled The Trial and Triumph of Faith. The other is called Christ Dying and Drugs Dinners to Himself. That is a much more rare volume. And there is a third volume called Communion Sermons, edited again by the same Andrew Bonner as edited the letters. And these last are quite superb sermons, communion sermons. They deal inevitably with cross-related themes and incarnation-related themes. And again, maybe I can just quote and share with you a couple of passages from these sermons. Now, what we have here, you see, is, uh, in the communion service particularly, is extemporaneous preaching. And uh, the, the language is that of the spoken, not of the written word. On the cross, uh, he says, Oh, what a fury was there! What a fury was there! God weeping! God sobbing under the water! Now, I find that remarkable because it seems to me to point very clearly towards the idea of the pain of God the Father himself around the cross. As you probably know, there is a great dogma called the dogma of the impassibility of God which says that God is incapable of pain or of suffering. God cannot feel anguish. In my view, that doctrine is not found in the Bible, but it came into theology through Greek philosophy, very early in Christian history. And I'm fairly confident that Rutherford subscribed to that dogma as a dogma. But when he was in the pulpit and he was expounded the story of the cross of Christ, the passion of a saviour. That doctrine flew out the window. And here he says, oh, what a fury was there. God weeping. God sobbing under the water. 
as the waters went over the sole of his son. God sobbing under the water. And he says again, as he contemplates Christ dying, Oh, to see life with a capital L. Oh, to see life wanting life. To see life lying dead. To see that blessed mouth silent. That's one of the great underlying themes of the Passion story. The life dies. And the word, the eternal logos, is silenced. And the light is eclipsed. There was darkness over the whole land till the ninth hour. Rutherford comments on that, on the darkness. The word, he said, lost its eye because the logos was dying. And there is another very fine passage on the incarnation of all this comes from Christ dying and going to live to himself. And it shows how these Scottish theologians in the Calvin tradition took so seriously the fact of the humanity of Jesus, but also how meticulously they clung to the idea that the incarnate Christ was a divine person, and the human life of Christ was the human life of God himself. God living a human life. And it speaks as follows of the blood of Christ. He, he gave to justice blood that chambered in the veins and body of God. He gave, he sacrificed to justice blood that chambered in the veins and body of God. Now behind the language of the preacher here, there is a masterful grasp of the Christology of the early church fathers and their insistence on the unipersonality of the incarnate Saviour. This blood that chambered in the veins and body of God. These veins belong to the human body of Christ. But whose veins were they? Who? Who was the who to whom they belonged? They belonged to the veins of God. It was the body of God. And that blood chambered, and there is, I think, a, a, a reflection there of uh, Rutherford's acquaintance with the terminology of the medicine of the day. But the blood chambered in the veins of God and in the body of God, because he knew that that's who Christ was. It wasn't a human nature that was crucified. It was a divine person who was crucified. And he adds this, well, we give the whole, the whole statement. He gave to justice blood that chambered in the veins and body of God, in which God had a personal being. God had a personal being. Now, I have read a fair bit of Christology and I have never seen that particular doctrine stated with such clarity in anyone between Rutherford and Karl Barth. It's Barth who says that in Christ God lived and earthly historical life. God lived an earthly historical life. These veins and this body in which God had a personal being. Who was the person 
whose body it was, who was the person whose veins they were, the body and the veins belonged to God. In them, God had a personal being. Brother Ford has such a magnificent grasp of Christology. And that reminds me of something very important, that it's often assumed that these Reformation divides, those Calvinist divides, that they majored on justification by faith or on the distinctive points of Calvinism. But you know, what we see here fully bears out a comment made once by Rabbi John Duncan. Duncan said, Duncan was a 19th century free church theologian. He said, there is something more fundamental than justification. Luther had said something like, justification is the article of a standing in a falling church. Those exact words don't occur in Luther, but the sentiment is Luther certainly. But Duncan said, there is something more fundamental than justification. And he said this, justification rests on the cross, and the cross rests on the incarnation. And therefore these are both more fundamental, more foundational. They are the foundation of the article of a standing in a fallen church. And time and again, this is borne out by Rutherford. They had a tremendous grasp of what was meant for God to become incarnate. Now, there is another echo of this in a forgotten 19th century Scottish theologian called Alexander Stewart, who was a Hugh Miller's minister in Cromarty. And Stewart had the same grasp of incarnation and Christology. And he said in a memorable statement once in one of his sermons that the blood that pours out of the veins of the Hottentot under the lash is the same blood that coursed in the veins of the Son of God. Now, in the 19th century, those Hottentots, these African bushmen, they were the very epitome of primitive savagery. As Stuart is saying, the blood of the hot and taut under the lash is the same blood that coursed in the veins of the Son of God. So firm was their grasp of the identifying of Jesus with the human race. Now those sermons cover many other themes such as assurance, for example, and also the offer of the gospel. And there is some remarkable language in, in, in Rutherford on this offer. There was a, a, a kind of implicit debate that was going on about the terms of the gospel. And could the gospel be preached to the reprobate? And Rutherford had no patience with this. He says, no one knows that he is reprobate. And it's never anyone's duty to believe that he is reprobate. But it is everyone's duty in the presence of the gospel to believe in the power of mercy to save him. It is everyone's duty in the face of the gospel to believe in the power of mercy to save him. And he said, Christ has a gospel for the elect and for the reprobate, and he has the same gospel for the elect and for the reprobate. And the highest Calvinist of Scotland, Mendic Adam Gibb, the 18th century seceder, who was a formidable Calvinist, they would use exactly that same form of words. The gospel to be preached in the same terms to the elect and to the reprobate. You don't have different language for the two groups. Christ has said, preach the gospel to every creature. Tell every man, every woman, every boy and girl, I have good news for you. The good news is the power of mercy to save you. 
there was never, I, I cannot trace, and I think I can say that quite literally, I cannot trace in the theological lineage of Scotland prior to the last 25 years, I cannot trace any hyper-Calvinism. That is the refusal to offer Christ fully and freely to every member of the human race. All the theologians were adamant about that. There was no doubt about it, whether it was Rutherford, who was a superlapsarian, high Calvinist of breathtaking altitude, or, or uh, Adam Gibb, who was a rigorous of the first order. They, they all had this, that uh, the gospel was the same terms for all men offering hope uh, through divine mercy. Now, I need to watch my time. The other publication that is worth noting is the famous book called Lex Rex. This is a remarkably coherent, condensed, overwhelming argument, and yet Rutherford wrote it while he was in London, away from home, attending the Westminster Assembly. And it is a head-on critique of the idea of the divine right of monarchy. And uh, it is completely subversive of Stuart absolutism. Now, that of course was so much the case that in 1661, the book was twice publicly burnt, once by the hangman and once by Archbishop Sharp, because it was supposed to be treasonable. I'm not entirely certain yet that Rutherford's political theology is entirely original. There is some evidence that medieval theologians had held a similar view, and certainly George Buchanan, who taught King James VI as a child, held very similar views and set them forth in a famous book called On the Right of Kings Among the Scots. But the essential thesis here is that kings do not reign by divine right. Instead, power lies with the people. And a king rules only by consent. And furthermore, the people never have the right to surrender that power. The people have no right before God to surrender power. God gave them the power. And they must not surrender that power. And if the king begin to govern in an ungodly way, then it is the right and the duty of the people to withdraw their consent. No king, Rutherford says, can rule by conquest or by force. He can rule only by consent. And he says, Kingly power, governmental power, is not by divine right, it is by consent, by covenant, by contract. And the people have the right and sometimes a clear duty to withdraw their consent and to replace the king, to replace the government. Now that, that was uh, revolutionary uh, and dangerous stuff. In the, in the 1640s. And it required great courage on Rutherford's part to take this position. But he had a fundamental principle which was not borrowed directly from biblical quotation, but was from, borrowed from classical political theology, which said that the, the health of the people is the first good. Salus populi primum bonum. The health, the well being of the public is the first good. And that is a very, very effective criterion for a democracy such as ours. It is not whether this king has some hereditary rights, 
But does this king promote the salvation and health and well-being of the people? If he does, then they could set to his governing them. If he doesn't, then they would draw his consent, and when they do that, he loses his power. The well-being of the people is the first good. Now, it's very difficult for us today to capture the flavor of this, not least because I think that we ourselves instinctively have little sympathy with revolution. And this is difficult for me because I am an instinctive revolutionary. But there is a long tradition here in Scotland, as I said, it goes back to George Buchanan, it comes through Samuel Rutherford. It occurs also in another 17th century book by Alexander Shields entitled A Hind Let Loose, in which there are some 200 closely printed pages on the right of the people to resist tyranny. This by a covenanting theologian of considerable eminence. And you may recall, of course, that towards the end of the covenanting struggle, around 1686, Richard Cameron deposed and excommunicated the king and declared Scotland a republic. And that really is part of where we're coming from. John Witherspoon, the only clergyman, the Sunday clergyman of independence in the United States, was very much a statesman in the Rutherford tradition. And there is no doubt that Rutherford's principles and Lex Rex had an influence on the American assertion of independence in the 18th century. And one can go back to it still. I, I think that, for example, when we're looking, when we're faced with apartheid 20 years ago, 30 years ago in Britain, we were all instinctively of the view that the ANC had no right to be rebellious. And we forget that we ourselves in Scotland signed a national covenant in 1638 pledging ourselves to defend the reformed faith by whatever means were necessary. And we went to war with the king in 1643. Because sometimes the people must withdraw their consent if the government is not promoting the well-being of the people. They must say, we withdraw your right to govern. Now, my mind was set, of course, more in the 19th and in the 17th century, but one area where I did eventually part company with disruption theologians was precisely here, because men like Chalmers and Cunningham were absolutely horrified by what these covenanters were saying. This language of subversion and revolution. But we were talking, John and I, in the car coming along about this, that Chalmers was living in the wake of the French Revolution, and the Duke of Wellington, and all the tremendous fear in Britain of a French Revolution type of revolution. And the last thing Chalmers wanted was someone to say, oh, you free church people are heirs of the Covenanters and Lex Rex and a hind leg loose. No, 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 they said. And when Chalmers laid the foundation of New College in 1846, he made a famous statement, which is often held against him and against the free church as well. He said, Nothing, he said, will ever be taught in these halls subversive of the prevailing order of society. Chalmers would not have welcomed the demand for universal franchise or for women's suffrage or for trade unions because he trembled the guillotines and the rivers of blood in Paris. He didn't want any of that. And they distanced themselves from these political thinkers of the 17th century. But I think all of us today recognize that 
without revolution, without the withdrawal of the consent on the part of the people, we'd never have had democracy. And that revolution was legitimized by the work of Bennett Rutherford and Buchanan and Shields. And in some ways, it is one of Scotland's most outstanding contributions to the history of human thought, that above any other nation on earth, we thought through the question of church-state relations and our duty in relation to a government which is not pursuing the good or well-being of the people. Now, I'll go to close, and there were things in Rutherford that one would not want to endorse either. He was uh, certainly not an advocate of toleration. He thought that all men should think as he did, and if they did not, then the state itself should prosecute them. We distance ourselves from that kind of thinking. We also know that he was a party to a frivolous and tragic division in the Church of Scotland around 1649, that very division that led to Durham's publication of a treatise on scandal, scandalous divisions. There was a very frivolous debate within the Church between engagers and resolutioners, and I've been trying to work out for 20 years what it was about. And each time I speak, but I've got to refresh my memory as to what in fact was the point at issue. It was something like this, that in 1649, a group of Scottish politicians entered into an engagement with the king to help him to keep his crown. And men like Rutherford took a dim view of this engagement. And they argued that all who signed it, all who signed it should be banned uh, from public office. And all the clergy who signed it should be deposed or excommunicated. Now, the trouble was that that led to division between, for example, men like Rutherford and Dixon. And it is very, very sad that at the end of their days, uh, these men should have uh, been so divided the one from the other over this very peripheral question. That's a very sad thing, but I'm going to close with this. In 1660, uh, Charles II was restored as King of the United Kingdom, and that had immediate implications for Rutherford and the Covenanters. Rutherford was summoned on a charge of high treason. And he was at that point uh, on a sick bed in St Andrews, and knew in fact that he was on his deathbed. And he told those who came with a summons, I have, he said, had a summons to a higher court, and before your day comes, I shall be for few kings and great ones come. And so it was, he died shortly afterwards, I think sometime in March 1661. Now, in a way, Rutherford died just in time. A few weeks afterwards, his friend James Guthrie was hanged and beheaded at the Market Cross in Edinburgh. And had Rutherford lived, he'd have suffered exactly the same fate. He died with these words on his lips, and this is what attested. Glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. And it was without sure and certain hope that he drew his very last breath. Well, I should now yield to the party and give up this uneven struggle. Okay, thank you. Thank you.